about, hey, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine, uh, we planned a little mini hunting trip in southwest Missouri. I was living in St. Louis at the time, and we left at like 2 in the morning, and the plan was we were going to hunt sun up to sundown and just be a good day in the woods, because any day in the woods is just a good day in the woods. And so we took our climber stands out, we had our food packed up, both of us had a key to the truck so we could, we could get in and take a nap if we needed to or whatever, and so I went out and I got in the stand. Doggone, I didn't even see a squirrel. I didn't think that was possible. I usually want to shoot squirrels when I'm deer hunting because they annoy me so much. I didn't see anything. So I got down out of my stand, you know, around 1 o'clock. I went and I ate lunch, overlooking some bluffs. I saw some bald eagles flying around. You know, I sang the national anthem in honor and just, you know, it was just a good day to be out. Then I, I kind of went the other direction and thought, maybe I'll have some luck going this way. I had no idea where my friend Tad was, at, you know, I, what direction he was. I didn't want to come up on him, but... I walked for a little bit, I found a good tree with some, looked like some just natural deer paths, and I climbed up, and <laughs> I didn't see anything the whole day. Well, I got out at dark, and got all my stuff packed up, and on my back, and it took me longer to get to the truck than I thought. I had walked a little further away than, than what I had realized, and it was such a long time to get back to the truck, I thought, I had to keep stopping, like, am I going the right direction? I had no idea, it was completely dark. I had like a headlamp, and I'm like, I, you know, I think this is good. I didn't even have an iPhone. This was, this was pre-iPhone for Doug. Had zero cell phone service. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to keep walking and hope for the best. Sure enough, I came up the parking area, got to the truck. I was ready to apologize to Tad, but he wasn't there. And I thought, oh, boy, this has been a while. I'm late getting back. Oh no, what if he's like gone looking for me? Or what if something happened to him? And I thought, well, what if he got a deer? How's he going to get the deer back to the truck by himself? That's going to be quite a job. There are a lot of hills in Missouri. But we didn't think this through. Because I have no idea where he's at, what's going on, is he safe? And so like, I don't know how much time passed, but I think it was, it was like 45 minutes I just sat on the the tailgate of the truck and just like when is he getting back and I got in loaded everything up and I start driving I'm like I got to go find somebody to get help my I still don't have service on my phone like I'm getting nervous and scared and some park rangers came pulling in as I was pulling out I thought oh great they'll save the day so we start talking and they're like well you guys don't have walkie talkies there's no cell service here how come you guys don't have walkie talkies I'm like we didn't think it through there's no help to me now we've got to go get my friend and they're like oh he's probably fine I'm like it's 8 30 it's been dark for two hours what do you mean he'll probably be fine like do we expect him to spend the night out there and so I'm arguing with them and they're arguing with me and I'm like well if something happens to them it's on you because you guys are the authorities and you guys are aware that he's out there and they're like no nah, he's probably fine and so I'm like well, I can't even call his wife to like tell her, hey, you know, your husband was with me when we went out, but he's not with me now, and I don't know where he is, and you know, I don't know what to do. Well, eventually, after all this time and arguing, and they're like, oh, there's a light down there. I'm like, that's like the light on the highway, like three miles away. That's not somebody's headlamp. And we can hear somebody grunting and coming up the hill. And I thought, oh, he did get a deer. That lucky duck, quack, quack. And so I come up over, I got my flashlight. No deer, he is crawling up the hill with his stuff. I'm like, hey, man, what are you doing? He's like, I blew out my knee. I'm like, what do you mean you blew out your knee? Come to find out, he had had knee surgery like four or six weeks before on his meniscus. Doctor told him, don't do anything. He thinks the doctor is stupid. Those were his words, actually. And he said, this is the only day I have to go hunt. So I thought, I'm going to go hunt. So he said, I got out to the tree. He said, I was working the climber stand. And then I heard a pop. And then my knee felt really warm. And then it hurt really bad. And I thought, well, I'm up the tree anyway. And so I'll just sit here until dark. And then I'll get back to the truck. And so that's, that's what he was doing. Half walking, half limping, sometimes crawling because he was in so much pain and I was like did did your wife know that we're hunting like is she well I told her I was gonna use a ground blind I told her I was gonna be with you and you're the pastor and so it gave me like she's like oh yeah if you're gonna go with Pastor Doug that's fine I'm like you're gonna get me in trouble with what's wrong with you 
And so, like, this whole thing was just a mess. We left three hours later than we should have, and I called my wife to let her know. I'm like, you're going to call your wife? He's like, no, 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 I'm not going to call my wife. I'm like, hey, it's probably better just to get that conversation over with, give her a few hours to cool off instead of walking in the door, not walking, limping in the door, and then trying to explain to her you did something you knew you weren't supposed to do. But the whole time he's like, you know what, though, the doctors, they always are just super cautious. I know my body better than the doctor does. And you have said that before, you stubborn people. You know your body so well that you performed the surgery yourself, didn't you? You didn't even have to go to the doctor. No, doctors are professionals, and I know they get things wrong, but we are so stubborn, we don't listen to them. And our timetable is different than theirs. But to be fair, doctors are humans, they get things wrong. But it's not just timetable for medical stuff. There's there are timetables for when to invest and when to buy what stocks. And maybe you're in that world of, I want you, you talk to your investment guy, I want you to invest in this. And he's like, well, no, wait. And you're like, no, it's my money. We're going to do what I want to do. It's my money. And then, he, you know, his timetable is different than yours, but you're calling the shots because it's your money. I think about sports as well. When does a kid move up to varsity or some kids go from high school to the NBA? I played against a guy uh, in junior college um, who ended up getting drafted to the NBA he actually owes some of that to me because he dunked on me harder than any human being I've ever seen dunk a basketball I jumped up and I fouled him and he dunked and there were scouts from the Raptors and the Celtics he got drafted by the Raptors and the, the reason I tell you that is that Rick Pitino he's supposed to go play for Louisville after um, Southeastern College and, and he ended up going to the NBA, and Rick Pitino said that's the biggest mistake that kid could have made because he's not ready. But they were promising him, you know, a multi-million dollar contract, and it's like, ah, what would you have done? Yeah, the timetable may be a little different, but if what happens if I don't get drafted after playing at Louisville for two years? If I can get drafted now and get the money, and so there's always things that work, and our timing is sometimes different than the experts, isn't it? People trying to coach us or tell us how we're supposed to manage our body, our money, our athleticism, whatever. But that's not only true in all these areas of life, it's true in our relationship with God as well. Sometimes his timetable, or his timing, or his will, or how he's moving things is different than what we desire. The difference between God and a doctor, or God and a coach, or God and an investment guru is that God is never wrong. And our job is not to get God on our timetable. Our job is to find a way to get on His. So as we continue our series through the life of Joseph and unpacking different elements of his story, what we see is that the, the timetable that God has in place is probably different than what Joseph would have wanted, definitely different than you and I would have wanted if we were in Joseph's condition. Now to remind you kind of where we're, where we're unpacking this series from and the mindset that we have is Genesis 50. I think it's the theme of the whole Joseph story. When Joseph is talking to his brothers at the end, and he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So oftentimes, people intend to harm us, or there's, there's chaos and calamity in our lives brought about by just the natural consequences of sin or brought about by the evil one, all different types of scenarios. And just like Joseph, God will use the bad for good. That's echoed in Romans 8, 28, when the Apostle Paul says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. And so we have a promise in Scripture. Not that things will always go our way, but in all things, God will work them out for good, for his glory and for the benefit of his people. And so as we jump into Joseph's story and pick back up, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 40. If you've got a Bible or your Bible app, I encourage you to open up to Genesis 40. And let's recap where we left Joseph last week. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. The Ishmaelites were the ones who took him to Potiphar's house in Egypt. While he's in Potiphar's house, things go really well for him. He's put second in command in Potiphar's house. And he gets falsely accused of a crime, which lands him in the king's jail or the king's prison. And while he's there, 
things go well for him once again. The warden can see that Joseph is a man of integrity, Joseph is a blessed man, and he has success in whatever he does, so the warden just keeps giving more and more jobs and responsibilities to Joseph, which is kind of funny, because the warden probably has a staff of people that work under him, and he keeps giving responsibilities to a prisoner. For someone who is kept in captivity, so to speak, with all the other inmates, Joseph kind of, he has this, this long leash, if you will. He's given authority, he's given responsibility, because it's clear to everybody, and in particular the warden, that Joseph is blessed by his God. And whatever Joseph does is successful and prosperous, and why not hitch your your trailer to that truck because if he's going to be successful let him do as much as he can do and then you'll by extension be successful as well and that's where we pick up in Joseph's story here's what it says sometime later the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master the king of Egypt Pharaoh was angry with his two officials the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and put them in the custody of the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. Now you do have a little bit of a differentiation between Joseph and these two individuals. Joseph was thrown in prison unjustly. He was innocent. He was falsely accused. And it says they made Pharaoh angry. To be fair, it probably wouldn't take a lot to make Pharaoh angry. And if he got angry at you and wanted you executed or wanted you thrown in jail, remember, there's no due process. There is no checks and balances in different branches of government. There's no constitution protecting the rights of individuals. What Pharaoh wants, as in the Egyptians' minds, a god king is going to happen. But it does seem to indicate that you know he, they made him angry and so he deals with their insubordination or he deals with their folly, whatever it is. Joseph's there innocently. They're there because they become a stench to their king and their leader. And so they go to jail. And the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. Well, I wonder how that got orchestrated. Remember, we're trying to see where God's fingerprints are throughout the story of Joseph and how many things just don't happen by chance, but happen because God is moving and acting behind the scenes. It goes on to say, after they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, they had a dream. The same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. I wonder where the dream came from. Anybody know? God, very good. Yes, you're paying attention goes on to say, when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Guys, why the long face? Yes, we're in prison. Yes, the food's terrible. But why are you more upset today than you are on other days? And they say, we both had dreams. But there is no one to interpret them. In Pharaoh's court, they probably would have had access to the magicians, to the wise men, to the sayers, and to the seance people of Egypt. And they thought that they had the special ability to interpret dreams. They're like, we, there's no one for us to go to. No one can inter interpret these dreams for us. And Joseph's like, well, don't interpretations belong to God, to Yahweh? Tell me your dreams. And so the, the uh, cupbearer goes first. He says, well, I have a dream. There's this vine that had three branches and the three branches started to sprout blooms and then there were grapes and the grapes were ripe and so I grabbed some of the cluster of grapes and I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand then I woke up that was my dream and Joseph said okay the three branches on the vine are three days and in three days time you will be reinstated. You will be restored to the job that you had before. You will once again be Pharaoh's cup bearer. And verse 14 says, But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. 
I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. Notice he does not say, and, and I don't want to make too much of this because it's a, it's a detail that's found in the absence of something. But he doesn't say, let me tell you something, my brothers. Like there's no animosity there. Wouldn't that be how you said it? Let me tell you I ended up in Egypt. My brothers, I hate those guys. They're knuckleheads. They were jealous of me. I was next in line. I was going to take over the family business. And they were going to kill me. And they decided to sell me into slavery. And they got all this money. Can you believe that? And then I end up in Potiphar's house. And while I'm there, things are going really, really well. And I'm really, really successful. And then his wife accuses me of something. I get thrown in jail. He didn't do that. I think that's interesting. His goal is not to place blame on any individual. His goal is to, or for things to be made right. So when you get back to your position, when you get back to your prominence, please talk to Pharaoh for me. Because I shouldn't be here. So the baker is listening to this. And he's like, well, that sounds pretty good. And when the baker saw that Joseph gave him a, fur, a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, well, I too had a dream. And in my dream, there were three baskets full of bread and baked goods. And on the top basket, it was on my head, the birds kept swooping down and eating the bread and the baked goods out of the basket. And I was trying to shoo them away, but I couldn't. What is the meaning of my dream? And Joseph's like, well... Three baskets, that's also three days. And in three days, Pharaoh is going to have you executed. And the baker's like, well, who asked you? Because it's like you did, literally, two minutes ago, remember? And so they've got these two different stories, two different dreams, happening the same night with very similar overlaid messages. Joseph interprets them, and then the waiting happens. So if you're the baker, I don't know, you, you, know, you wake up the next day, are you nervous? Are you frustrated? Are you scared? Do you trust Joseph? Does he know what he's talking? He's just a common criminal. He's in the prison with us. What does he know? But then the third day comes. And verse 20 tells us, Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. And he lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. Look at that. Pharaoh's working on his birthday, having like a little mini trial, trying to figure out what's going to happen to these two guys. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand, just as Joseph predicted, but he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. And I wonder how that played out. How the forgetting of Joseph played out. Because on the third day, the warden came to the cell and he said, Cupbearer, baker, Pharaoh has summoned you. And they probably both went gulp. Now, the cupbearer has some optimism. Because he knew he was going to be brought before Pharaoh. According to Joseph, it's happening. And he got a favorable interpretation. The baker is like, how do I, can I run? Am I faster than these guys? How do I get out? So it all plays out. It happens exactly as Joseph said. Joseph knows what's going to happen. God gave him the interpretation. And then Joseph waits. And he waits. And he waits. If you look at chapter 41, verse 1. It begins by saying, and when two full years have passed, think about that. Joseph has an expectation. On the third day, the cupbearer is going to stand before Pharaoh. He's going to be reinstated. And then he's going to say, Pharaoh, I knew this was going to happen. There's this guy in jail. His name's Joseph. And then go into the whole explanation. So J Joseph is waiting. And days turn into weeks. Weeks turn into months, months turn into seasons, seasons turn into years. And day after day, Joseph's like, I thought I was getting out of here. It happened just like I predicted. How could the cupbearer forget about me? It could have been something supernatural that caused the cupbearer to kind of be like out of sight, out of mind. And that it wasn't God's timing for Joseph to get out. 
It could have been that the cupbearer forgot, not like absent-minded, but just took a calculated, you know, inventory and just said, you know what, I just got out of jail. And if I start advocating for this prisoner who, you know, was in cahoots with Potiphar's wife in some way, like, that could end me back up in jail if Potiphar finds out he doesn't like it and he goes to Pharaoh and there's a big accusation. So maybe I should just not say anything. But whatever the situation, we know that it wasn't on God's timing for Joseph to get out then because if it would have been, he would have gotten out then. Two full years go by. So think about it. I mean, he was taken into captivity, sold to Potiphar. He was there for a while. Then he was, went to jail, and he was there for a while. And after two full years, like we're talking about an eight-year process from when he was taken from home until he stands before Pharaoh. And those dreams that he had, that his brothers would bow down to him, that his brothers and parents would bow down to him, the dreams that God gave him, I think, to ultimately fuel hope in God and faith in God, it's like, how is God, how is this going to happen? That was my chance to get out, and, I, and I'm still here. Why did it take so long for Joseph to be released? Could it be that Joseph had some more lessons to learn while he was there, lessons on leadership, lessons on humility, and so God allowed him to be there for an extra two years, and, and though day after day Joseph's praying to get out, God's like, you're not ready yet? Just like when the doctor says, don't go climb a tree with a climber stand, you're not ready yet? Joseph, you just need to wait a little bit longer? I'm not done with you yet? I'm not done preparing you and your leadership skills? Could that be? Could it be that Joseph needed to have his faith kind of a little bit bigger? He needed to grow a little bit? You think about your life and moments or seasons where your faith has really grown. It's not on times where you wake up and you're healthy and things are going well. It's usually moments or, or events or seasons in life when things are going really bad and things are really difficult. Your prayers sound different and you pray with more frequency, you pray with more you pray with more fervent more fervently. Like in those moments, your faith gets bigger because you have nowhere else to turn and it looks like all hope is lost. Or maybe Joseph was just jumping ahead of God's timing, that he was trying to organize, okay, oh, you're you're a part of fair you had this dream, you're gonna be back. Okay, here's what you need to do. And he was jumping ahead of God's plan, and he was trying to go outside of God's plan in a way. But the bottom line is, we don't need to know why. And Joseph doesn't need to know why he stayed in prison. His job is just to have faith and be obedient. And that's our job as well. In our lives, we are to be o- obedient and prayerful and humble and have faith in God regardless of how the circumstances in our lives are playing out. Joseph's story ends, spoiler alert, with him getting brought before Pharaoh and him being second in command. And it's, it, it, it's like, oh, wow, look at all that God did. Isn't this great? And sometimes we look for a Joseph-type story in that we think, okay, I'm going through a tough season, but everything's going to get better on the other side. Like, Joseph was in Potiphar's house, but... God had something better, and so if I get fired or if I lose my job, God's got something better. And listen, God's promise of working all things for our good is not necessarily that things go our way or get better and we get more money or a bigger house or whatever it is we want in this life. We focus too much on the temporary, and we elevate it above the eternal, and we elevate the physical above the spiritual, and God moving in our lives is about advancing his kingdom. But I can promise you, no matter how bad things are in your life, no matter how dark or how bleak, God hurts with you. Because if you've gone through something, some moment of pain or hurt, some season of life that's just hard to get through, maybe it's you're praying for your kids. And maybe they're going through a rebellious season. And it's a rebellious season, not like, you know, they're sometimes disrespectful, but like, you're like, I don't know if they're coming back. 
type of thing. And your heart breaks for them. And you're calling out to God. And you feel like when you pray and the more you pray, it's like deaf ears. Or maybe you're praying for your finances. Maybe you're praying for your marriage. Maybe you're praying for someone in your life who's lost, who doesn't know Jesus. And you pray and you pray and you pray. And if you're not careful, there are seasons where you will start to believe, you know what, I don't think anything in my life would change if I prayed or I didn't pray. I don't think anything's happening right now. You feel far from God because your circumstances seem so bleak. And you're like, I feel like God should have done something by now. I feel like things should be different by now. I've prayed for this enough. God, where are you? And what we don't realize is in those moments, God isn't sitting on his throne looking at creation and looking at your life and looking at your pain and saying, get over it or deal with it. Or like, God is with us and he hurts with us. And when you have nowhere to turn and you cry out to God, like God is there. And you may not feel it in the moment, but that's because our hearts have become hardened or cold because things aren't turning out the way we want. It's not our job to know why. It's not our job to, it's just our job to be obedient and have faith. That's our job. And to keep praying and never lose hope. Jesus tells this parable in Luke's gospel of a persistent widow. When I was teaching this to a junior high Sunday school class once, the the junior high that was called to read it, he was like, and the persistent window, and he read that for the rest of the thing. So every time I say it, I was going to make sure I say widow and not window because it's in my head now. Now it's in your head, so have fun teaching that passage to people. So this widow keeps coming to this judge, and he's an unjust, callous judge. And day after day she comes, and she's demanding justice against her adversary. She's been taken advantage of. She's been abused in some way, and she's like, this is wrong. It's an injustice. You're a judge. You need to intervene and do something about it. And she comes day after day after day, and the judge is like, I don't fear God. I don't care about this lady, but she's annoying the snot out of me. She's wearing me out. So I'm going to give her what she wants so that she leaves me alone. And you're like, well, that seems like a bleak picture. Is that how God is with us? Leave me alone. Fine, have this. But Jesus goes on to say, if this is how an unjust judge, who doesn't fear God, who doesn't love people, if that's what he would do, how much more would your heavenly Father, who loves you unconditionally and is perfect in all of his ways, how much more will he do what is right in your life? And Jesus tells that parable, So that we always pray and never give up. So for Joseph, it was two years before he got out of jail. It could have been 10 years, it could have been 30 years, it doesn't matter. God's timing is perfect. And I think Joseph, throughout the course of that two years, prayed every single day and probably learned, I don't have to figure out when or how. I just have to be obedient to God and his timing. The same is true for us. When you're praying for the different things in your life, that sickness that's not being healed, you pray for that marriage, you pray for that child, you pray for your finances, you pray for your job, you pray for our country, you pray for the pandemic, and you're like, how long, Lord? How much longer is this going to go on? I'm crying out to you. Our people are crying out to you. God, how much longer? And when God hurts with us, he says, just wait. My timing is perfect. I love you unconditionally. You have just got to trust me. Because in all things, I will work for the good of those who love me. And so if you go against your doctor's advice, which you all have at some point, you sinful people, But if you go against your doctor's advice, you have that right. 
you go outside of what your investors, that you have that right. But with God, he's always right. And if our timetable is different than his, if our will is different than his, if our preferences are different than his, he's not the one who's wrong. It's us. And we need to find how to bend towards his will and not have us, or not have him bend towards us. Because if God's perfect and right all the time, you don't want your way. Because that, that means that your way, if it's different than God's, is sometimes wrong. 